Welcome to the Tea Hut, the podcast for unorthodox entrepreneurs striving for success by going against the grain, breaking down barriers beyond the biscuit tin, revealing what property professionals and construction workers really talk about on their tea breaks. Join us as we delve deep to uncover what it takes to succeed and be the best version of yourself. Welcome to the Tea Hut podcast. And if you've never stopped for a brew in the cabin, this is where we break down the barriers beyond the biscuit tin, uh, disrupting normal patterns of conversation, asking the questions that nobody else does. I like mine strong like mud with one sugar. So before we get into it, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel for fortnightly episodes. So I'm, I'm buzzing. I'm buzzing that we're here. We're doing it. Um, and I'd like to introduce my guest, Mr. Richard Stone. So, hello, Richard. Hello. It's great to see you actually making this happen, and really great to be a part of it. Mate, when did I, I spoke about doing this at the retreat last yeah. year, didn't I? In, uh, 13, 14 months ago now. Yeah, and it's only now materialising. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing to be doing it, mate, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, you're actually my first official guest on the Tea Hut podcast, mate. Let's get it done. So uh, let's get right into it, mate. Um, you know, obviously, I know who you are. Um, well, I like to think I do anyway. Um, so for our audience and, and my listeners, new and old, um, if you want to tell people who you are um, and tell us a little bit about yourself, mate, what do you do? So my name is Richard Stone. I am a chartered construction manager and trained QS. I've been in construction 40 years last year since I was in my first foot in. Um, well over 50,000 refurbs, small projects, massive projects, stuff up to and over over 100 million, all manner of different stuff, mm. operationally, commercially. Um, I've moved away from the contracting stuff under our own brand now, um, and I'm doing stuff as joint ventures with other people and um, have moved into training and coaching and mentoring other people, teaching them project management systems so that they can basically get to leverage my experience without having to go through the pain and the, the cash challenges that that's brought about and also experience the wins that it's brought about because, mm. you know, construction's great, you can earn a lot of money in it, but only if you do it right. So it's about actually now sort of taking the knowledge that I've gained and passing that on to other people to, to be able to help them on their journey far quicker. Oh, that's great. I, I know it's one word in there, pain. And it is painful, isn't it? Like, you can know, be. It can, can be. be. Really painful. Uh, and I'm speaking from a, uh, a development perspective. Um, obviously, that's how me and you met on, on Andy Hubbard's. Um, yeah, we did. On his retreat in Tenerife last year. Uh, did we meet before that? We hadn't met before that. We hadn't that. met before that. We'd spoken before that, on but Facebook we'd not actually stuff. met before that. Yeah, We yeah. actually met so, on the terrace. Yeah, on the terrace, mate. <laughs> in uh, January. That was brilliant. And, and I, I know for you that was a, that was a good time. And, um, you know, for me, it really uh, cemented where I wanted to be heading just by being around mm. people yeah. uh, like yourself and the other guys that were there, which I really enjoyed being around. And uh, it's good to be in that environment with people, isn't it? What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, retreats get a lot of stick, you know. A lot of people say, oh, it's just a glorified holiday. Make no mistake, it's no holiday. No, I wouldn't say so. It's, it's, you know, it's a proper hardcore environment where you're talking about sort of personal personal wins and challenges and business channel challenges because anybody who believes that they can separate effectively 100% their personal and their business life is is disillusioned in my mind. Mm. You know, they go they, the two things go hand in hand. And for me, to be able to be out of the business for a week and actually thinking about looking at stuff looking on the business as opposed to actually being in it mm -hmm. is absolutely crucial and I was talking to a client this morning I had a meeting with before I came to, to uh, do this with you and we were, talk we were talking about that exact model and it's about actually for me yeah it's about actually getting some getting something from the experience but it's also probably it's probably like 90 10 so 90 percent of it is me actually wanting to like help and support and other share people. with other people with the knowledge that I've got to help them mm -hmm. get to where they want to go quicker so a lot of people go with a kind of like, uh, what can I get out of it? It's Whereas more, I'm more, it's more what than just can I serve? Yeah. For you, isn't it? yeah, massively so. Yeah, it's how can I help other people get further faster? Mm. And that's sort of similar to me, and I think that's why I resonate with you a lot um, because I will sooner um, think about other people's interests and how I can 
better their situations before I might think about my yeah. own. Um, maybe that's just my nature as a person because I've always been a bit like that. But if you could describe yourself, I mean, it's quite a hard question, I think. But if you could describe yourself in just three words, what would it be? I'd come back to my values. Um, which are honesty, integrity, and education. And I think they are, I always want to be seen as somebody that will give more than they receive. Mm. And I always, I would never, ever want anybody to ever say, he stood at the bar and never brought his round. Mm. Mm. It kind of means a little bit less nowadays because I'm pretty much teetotal. But that's <laughs> yeah. that's kind of where I've always tried to come from, is yeah. I've always tried to give more than I take back. And mm. that's what, put, it's what, it's why I enjoy being in the training arena so much, because to be able to give back to a room of people at a course, mm is really a really valuable thing for me to be able to do. And mm. it's, I consider it kind of like the best and highest use of my time, really. So, what, what is it? I mean, if you could pinpoint exactly what it is that makes you feel like that, why is that one of your main values? What is the feeling that you get when you are in that capacity delivering a talk to a group of people? What, 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 why, why is that a value to you? Why, why does that make, mean so makes my much? heart sing. Yeah, makes me feel complete. Makes me feel like I'm putting something good and positive into the world. Yeah, and I'm. I'm There's a lot of people will say that. Do you know yeah, what I mean? A lot oh yeah, of people I know. Will say things. Yeah, like I've that. met like, so oh, yeah, many people. I like to do things for other people, yeah. and when really it's a load of bollocks. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's a load of smoke and mirrors. And yeah. I've met a lot of people that enter the training space because mm. they just want to do it to make money, as opposed mm. to actually want to. They want to serve people. They want to help people, and they want to stop people getting. I was going to say mugged off, but getting missold something that mm. that f people believe it's it's actually going to be really really easy. Nothing in life worth having is easy. Oh mate, no, hundred percent. But to having be... the right systems in place oh, mate. definitely makes it a lot yeah, easier. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll digress onto that a little bit later because that's actually sort of one of my later questions. But um, yeah, no, I, I agree with that, and I, I I'm similar. Like I can't, I couldn't really put my finger on it as it's a feeling that I get when I'm talking to someone and they're engaged with what you're saying and you know they come up to you afterwards and they're like thank you do you know what I mean and it's like I didn't do it mm. for a thanks or yeah exactly I just did it because I enjoy it. I, I actually really enjoy that scenario you know yep. being in front of people talk you know I do I, I fucking mm. talk a million miles an hour that's anyway. why I love networking so much yeah. getting to have great conversations with people about stuff that they're genuinely passionate about mm. there's nothing worse than having a conversation with, conversation with someone and they're all the time looking over your shoulder because mm. they're trying to find someone more interesting oh yeah I just I absolutely just drives me insane whereas actually that's why I, you know most of my friends are people that I have sort of come to become friends with through work yeah because we've got that commonality the mm -hmm. people that i went to school with very very few of them i even have anything to do with i mean obviously me so, and Gemma met at school and we married so mm. that's the exception to that rule but mm. very few other people yeah i'm, I'm the same i've probably got like you always say i could probably count my friends on one hand that's a bit of an old saying but i'll pr probably take me half a hand <laughs> do you yeah. know what i mean if i'm honest but you know then people will be there for you no matter what yeah. 24 7 yeah you know i've got a good friend coming to see me this weekend actually and you know we haven't properly socialized for jesus you're probably saying 10 years but he's been my best friend for yeah. 20 do you know what i mean so you know we cannot talk for a year and yeah like, that's the thing with real good friends you don't need to be like wrapped around each other 24 no. 7 texting or phoning you understand, or don't you? yeah you, you know where it. yeah especially you've got kids and all that sort yeah, of stuff life gets in the way doesn't it definitely so what was your you know going back to when we first met i mean we'd already interacted a little bit online socials before like you said but what was your first honest impression of me as a person my first impression, yeah. someone that's quite prepared to be open, honest, and wear their heart on their sleeve. Mm. And mm. like someone that's quite clearly a very strong family person, I would say, was the, they were the overwhelming things that sort of came across. Mm. Now, was that shaped by the fact that you were with Ali, your wife, when I met you? I don't know. Uh, mm. It may it may or may not have been, but that was the first, the first kind of impression I took away from you. Well, yeah, like I'd say, you know, that is probably because Ali was with me because... We do everything like that together. Mm. Um, you know, me and Ali are on well and truly on this journey together. I mean, since we got married and uh, got together and, you know, I started the business and then she left her job to come and work within the construction business we were running and things like that. Um, yeah, we do everything together and it means, family means loads to me, as I know it does to you as well. We've, we've you know, spoke about that quite a bit before and 
Yeah, no, I appreciate that impression actually because you know first impressions are everything, aren't they? I think because it, yeah, it's certainly sort of, are. It, you know. <laughs> You can you can like someone when you meet them, um, but then learn stuff about them over time, and it sort of skews it your evolves. judgment a little yeah. bit. I mean, has your has okay? This is a bit of another question for you. Has your judgment of me changed in that year that, you know, since we've known each other a little bit more? No, I think it's only really been cemented mm. because obviously we've sort of got to know each other a lot more. You know, we've we've done a lot of stuff together. You know, you're yeah. one of my clients. Mm. We work together quite a lot. We socialise together, you know. Mm. We, me and you, you go out for dinner with our wives and stuff. We've yeah, done yeah. networking events. We've done masterminds together. So, mm. you know, we've done a lot of stuff together. I think it's just evolved over the course of a period of time, if I'm honest. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. You know, it's, it's again. That's why one of the main things that I absolutely love about being in this space is meeting like-minded people. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of people out there that ain't of the, the like mind. Yeah, but and I think I think the other thing to say about that is. Like-minded people is great, but I love like-minded people with polar opposite opinions. Yes. Because then yeah. you can have some really good conversations. Yeah, yeah. I, there's nothing worse than just being in an echo chamber with a load of people that just all think the same thing. 100%. Because you may as well not bother having a conversation. Yeah. It's about actually having conversations that that, that question your mindset, question mm. your thoughts, you know. And, and maybe and change your outlook on That's things. how your paradigm changes that's and evolves. That's what it's all about, isn't it, yeah, right? of course it is, because Absolutely. I've been in situations a lot myself so over the past couple of years where I might have had a certain opinion on something or uh, a certain situation or somebody and then I've got to know that person or I've, or I've took a bit of a different viewpoint on the situation. It's actually changed my outlook on things. Um, like I said a little bit earlier about there being smoke and mirrors as such, yep. um, which is... You know that happens a yeah, lot, it does, there, yeah. doesn't it? And yeah. you know, until until you're in it uh, and you can actually see it for what it is, I think it's it's quite easy to be um, swayed if you're just looking at the sugar coated stuff that is out there readily available yeah. online and stuff. It's easy to be swayed, but also you know we all have our own filter. I mean, I, I haven't shot for, shot a gun for a long time, but I used to do a lot of clay shooting, mm. and I I used to have a set of I think they were bowl shooting glasses, and they had different color lenses that were interchangeable depending yeah. on what you were doing. Mm. And it's so true. I, you know, I do a lot of consultancy work and non-exec work, and some of it's for main contractors and some of it's for subcontractors and some of it's for suppliers. Mm. Each one of those has a different mindset mm. because they're a different part in the journey and they're yeah. different, they're a different level of contractual Although they're part risk. of the same process. They're all part of the same project. They might even be working on the same site. Yeah. But they'll have a different mindset. And mm. people don't necessarily appreciate that in construction. They just assume that everybody's just a builder and actually they're, they're not. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Um, so what does success mean to you? What does success mean? What does it mean? Or what does it, it mean to you of? as a person? What does it mean? If you, were to, if you were to say, you know, consider yourself as being a successful person. I don't know because I'm not there. Exactly. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> That's what I wanted to I'd, hear. I'd, I'd, I'll let you know when I get there. Yeah. What does it consist of? Yeah, I what, think. What, what does it look like to you? If you, could, if you could say to me, right, Rob, I've got my ideal you know dream scenario where success would be okay you know as in like so goals and stuff yeah so so yeah i've got i've got goals um me i've got personal goals and then me and Gemma have got like joint goals one of the biggest things we've done is we actually work together on a 12 week year program mm. so we've got instead of having goals for the end of the year we've got goals for the first quarter yeah i've heard about that it's phenomenal really it's a good book but it's a really really good way to yeah. live really good way to live mm. because it means that you take a lot more action because you've got a shorter time frames absolutely you know you're not anybody, looking at something in 12 exactly, months anybody time. will go do you know what? i don't feel great today i feel a bit lethargic mm. well that goal that i've got for a year i've got another 300 days mm. well, you haven't if you're working into a 12-week program yeah so that makes you take a lot more action um i've got some very very big hairy ass goals for stuff that i want to achieve personally mm. um but i've got some even bigger ones for things that i want to achieve within the industry mm. um my original goal a few years ago was to do my TEDx. By the time I was 60, I've already done that. Mm. So now I want to be on the main TED stage. Mm. Um, I want to speak to an audience for 100,000 mm. live mm. at a venue. Yeah, I remember you saying that. It's That's a, that's a big thing Mate, for you'd me. You'd smash that. You'd um, smash that. You know, I'm, I work on my, my speaking and stuff every single day. Is there day. a difference to speaking to 100 to 100,000? Um, yes, in terms of the tech and, and all of that sort of stuff and venues and that kind of thing. Um 
in reality, the message is the same. That's what I'm saying. Is it, you know, message, you know, you're still on that stage. You yeah. still got to get up there and say, be, com- you know, stand convicted yeah. to what you're putting across. Absolutely. I mean, I've driven 300 miles to speak to an audience that was meant to be 20 and, and ended up being six. <laughs> yeah, you know, and yeah. it, we turned it almost into like a mini mastermind. I've done yeah, audiences yeah. in the hundreds. I spoke at your great inaugural event you um, for your summit you um, last year. Uh, I don't know how many, what was that, 150 ish? Yeah, in the but room? 150 through the door. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, I've done that. I was MC for World Game Changers, which is a charity that I'm director of ethics and entrepreneurialism for. Mm. Um, I was MC of their opening summit on HQS Wellington last year. Mm. Uh, there was just over 200 people there. So I've done some, you know, they're not massive audiences, but they're decent sized audiences. And, you know, my speaking is something I work on all the time. So really, my goals are around sharing knowledge and information and sort of kick into the curb some of the myths that exist within construction about what construction is, mm. where, is it a good career or not? Um, and, and that kind of work is, is a lot of where my focus is, as well as building financial f- um, freedom for my family for future generations and then protecting that so that um, mm-hmm. it's not um, at the mercy of the government to just go and to whip it away. spend on whatever they see <laughs> fit this week. So what are you, like, property-wise? I mean, what are you looking, what's your aspirations for with developments and things like that? Um, so we've got JVs with a number of people that we're doing developments with. Um, I haven't got any specific goals within property. Mm. I know that, that sounds really weird. My goals are more around reaching a wider audience with the with the training and the mentoring and stuff that mm. I do mm. because that, for me, is about having an impact. Mm. You know, how much impact can I have apart from on the environment going to build a house? Yeah. You know, all right, I might make 100, 150 grand, you know, might build an ultra high net worth house and make a million quid out of it, but that's just money. Yeah. If I can have 20 people, 30 people in a room every month doing a training course mm. that's actually giving them skills to go and do it themselves, mm. that's a far bigger, far reach, far wider reaching impact that I can have. And, that's what I want to spend the rest of the time that I've got left doing. Yeah, because who knows when that's up, right? Exactly. You know, tomorrow's not guaranteed for anyone, is it? Unfortunately not, mate. Um, so where does where does your drive come from as a person? If you could, if you could link back to, you know, maybe not a specific event in your life, but a period of your life where you went through and, you know, you knew that, you had to change or you know you had to change the dynamic of your well, thoughts and things to, to move forward and things like, i know i'm d- going to be yeah, deep no, now, that's, but as if, yeah that's fine um i think there's a number of uh, there's a number of what i would call or what i would term seminal moments in my life i think mm. um the first one that was probably well the first one was when i was about five my mum got taken to hospital mm. and all i remember is they're getting carried downstairs on a chair like this horrible metal tubular frame chair when ambulance had, Drivers wore like shirts and ties, mm. took her off to hospital, and I never knew what was wrong with her. So, so I've got that vivid, vivid memory. Um, I we did a extension on the house that mm. my mum and dad owned, which was when I was it was forty years ago this year. So I was I was six. So that was a massive seminal moment because I t- I knew just being involved in building that. That that's what I wanted to be involved in construction, taking loads of stuff and actually physically creating something was massive for me. And then we moved house when I was eight. My dad got promoted and we moved from Birmingham to Bristol. And I got really badly bullied because of my accent because I went from I talking, yeah, no right, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. talking <laughs> like a brummy <laughs> to talking like a carrot cruncher from Bristol. Um, so yeah, it was it wasn't a, it wasn't a nice it wasn't a nice time in my life for probably the first sort of two years that I was there. And um, I really didn't enjoy school at all. And obviously, I sort of, I think I'd already worked out, really, what I wanted to do. So, like, there'd be, like, a, a there was a wall in our garden that I, like, used to knock down and rebuild all the time to practice my bricklaying <laughs> and stuff. Like, <laughs> like age, like, nine. <coughs> Honing your <coughs> skills. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. With some, like, Harris Pointing trail that was, like, not, <laughs> not meant for laying bricks at all. It was, like... It was a bit of a car crash, but I'd like help my mum and dad with like decorating and like get right involved in stuff. And then at ten, I got a job in the pub, washing up. Mm. Or was it? Did I start washing up? Yes, I started washing up. I got a trial because um, someone else had left, and my mum did, my mum worked behind the bar, and I got a, I got a trial done washing up, and I I just loved it. And I was like, right, what do I do? You know, I can wash up, but I've never worked in a kitchen. And my mum and dad just said to me, look, just be on time, mm. be polite, and work hard. Just show up. Just show up. Be but always, always, always show up. Mm. 
So I did that, and I ended up doing Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday How night. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was I was just uh, probably 11. Okay, I just so turned 11. fairly young. Yeah, I was quite young. Yeah. And um, so the trial went really well. I ended up doing Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday lunchtime, because it was like everyone used to go out Sunday lunch. It was old school opening hours. Yeah, yeah. So, like, everyone would go for, like, Sunday dinner, have a few beers, and go home, pub and shut. Yeah, yeah. And um, the guy who used to do the bottling up got lazy and got sacked. So they were like, listen, do you want to come do bottling up? I was like... Yeah, okay, I don't really know what it means. But I was like, do you know what? Yes, I'll figure it out I'll later. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, just show me once and I'll yeah, learn yeah, it. Yeah. So I started doing that. And then the landlord had got a son who had a landscaping company. And um, I was quite a, I was quite a big guy even then. And um, he was like, listen, do you want a hand like come load out a load of turf with me one day? Mm-hmm. So, so I've done that. And then the next, like, he was like, Okay, do you want to like bunk school and come to work during the week? Mm. <laughs> Hell yeah! What cool, earn money rather than go <laughs> sit in the classroom? Hell yeah! <laughs> so I used to go to the pub in the morning, bottle up, and then some days I'd like go off landscaping with him. Yeah. And then one of his mates had got a scaffolding firm, so I ended up doing some scaffolding with him, l- like labouring for them. And I really enjoyed it. I just enjoyed like physical manual collar and earning some money. Yeah. And um, I sort of they weren't very good at maths and they were like struggling with some of their numbers and stuff and you see like all these bits of paper in the van like receipts everywhere like, yeah <laughs> and, uh, but like workings out for jobs and stuff yeah and fag packets driving to a job one day and there was like this page just with like and it was it weren't even like a notebook it was like a, it was like a letter I think mm. but I don't know what the letter was for it was like a hospital letter or something and on the back they'd written out like how to price this job but uh, maths was wrong <laughs> yeah seriously and it was like wrong by about three grand and right. it was only for like three or four houses there's it wasn't profit. a big site there's profit gone yeah and i was like what is what's this it's like don't even add up and i was like laughing and joking just having a bit of banter in the lorry yeah and i'm like what do you think you could do better then I'm like, yeah. yeah and that was it i started ended up doing their numbers from really that was where it started yeah but because because i was really bullied at school i didn't fit in i didn't mm. like anyone didn't have really have any friends mm. but because I just turned up and worked hard in the pub and worked hard with the with the son, I got respected. Mm. And, f- and for me, that was that moment. Mm. If you turn up, work hard, you re- ask questions, you, be you, polite. You realise or recognise yeah. that by applying yourself, like you say, turning up and just doing what's yeah, asked. Yeah, exactly. You get the results. Simple yep. as that, isn't it? That was it. And for me, it was kind of... It was that moment when... I sort of lost interest completely in people my own age because mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I'd, I'd work in the pub, but I'd go and take meals out to people at their table. I'd like serve dinner. I served behind a bar on nights when it was like real double busy. Mm. So I was, I was bantering and talking to people my own age and keeping a conversation with yeah. people that were a lot older in the pub. Mm, I think that's where I was like that at a young age because I was, um, I was always quite mature mm. for my age. Um, and, I was always thrust into situations where I was, um, you know, socialising with people that were a lot older than me. My mum and dad's friends always used to say, how can he grown up? Do you know what I mean? I'm 13 years old and out there smoking a spliff and doing all this, that and the other and being a tear away. And yeah, I saw, because I was in that, when when you're in those sort of situations, forced to grow up Mm. quickly, um, I think it can really have a profound effect on how you turn out as an as an adult, don't you think? Yeah, massively, it does undoubtedly. I mean, for me, I was I was no longer interested in people my own age. Yeah, me neither. So we then, when I was thirteen, my dad got promoted again, and we moved from Bristol to Wing in Buckinghamshire. Mm. I had to leave my job. I didn't want to go. I was this like, horrible, petulant kid. I was like, <laughs> I wouldn't even go and look at houses. <laughs> yeah. Like my mum would be going like, you didn't remember like before right move, people used to send you like the po- yeah, photo yeah, of yeah. a house. In the my paper. Mom, <laughs> yeah, in the, yeah. My mum would like, oh, look at this house. I'm like, not interested. Yeah. And they'd go off for the weekend and go like viewings and stuff. Yeah. I'm like, I'm staying at the pub working. Mm-hmm. So I used to stay at the pub. Anyway, we ended up having to move and I had to go. So I went, and on my first day in school, and this is the thing that I talk about in my TEDx talk, I met a lad called John Bradley, mm. and he was just really nice to me. Mm. Just was like, "You right, mate? Do you want anything? Can I can I look after? Not it's fucking can I look unheard after of you, these days, isn't it? Oh, mate, he'd stick a shank in there, wouldn't he? Yeah. But he was just really nice to me, and um, it restored faith in people my own age a little bit. Yeah. And we we became like best mates for for a good many years, mm. and um, sadly he took his own life um, a number of years ago, but. Well, that's that, a whole different story. That actually lead, teased me up absolutely perfectly for my 
next question, I think. Uh, we I already know a little bit about your story, or quite a lot of it, because we've spoke about our experiences. Uh, but there will be people out there that listen to this that don't know who Richard Stone are or Robbie Dunchow is. Hopefully, that's the aim for this fucking podcast, that someone actually fucking listens. Um, but if they don't, we've had a good conversation. If they don't, yeah, I'm sure they will, mate. I'm sure they will. But, you know, in your own words, you know, can you just just touch on your experiences with mental health, depression, what that is to you, um, and how you've dealt with it and how you've yeah. over I know that's a really broad brush. <laughs> it's right? a big subject. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's okay. So where do I start? So to, uh, the probably the best way to do it is to give some context to my life first. So yeah, that yeah, people yeah, understand why, why, why my reasons I went there. Um I've lost two really, really good friends mm. um to suicide. One when I was eighteen. Um, and I found out by looking at my phone with loads of missed calls. Me, yeah. And it still makes me go cold even now thinking about it. And then uh, John Bradley, unfortunately, many years later when I was in my mid-30s, both felt exactly the same. Mm. Um, still think about both of them every single day. Um, I think mental health is something that is starting to be talked about a lot more now. Yeah. Um, but I'm not convinced that we're actually having the right conversations mm. because... You know, the male suicide rate is still way, way, way too high. And mm. there's a lot of work to do. You know, you're talking about breaking down hundreds of years of social stereotyping yeah. before you can it's even begin stigma, to unpack all of this stuff, you know. Yeah. And, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that it's going to take generations to, mm. to actually to be able to, to bring bring about actually kind of like a global understanding that actually it's not it's there's a big phrase about it, it's okay to not be okay it's yeah. the biggest fucking load of bollocks ever <laughs> yeah. how can it be okay to, to be, not be okay yeah how, how is can that, that okay that's, that's like, well you break your leg you're right why are you not playing the premier league yeah, come this on, weekend? what's the matter with you crack on yeah. it's, it's ridiculous and it, yeah. it, it 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 does however serve a really important purpose and that is the power of language mm. because most people talk in a far more negative way to themselves than they will to other people. Is it self-affirmation? No, it's self-criticism. People will be far more critical of themselves than they ever would of a friend. Mm, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'm, f I'm f like, like uh, people say to me, oh, like you're doing really well, you've got this, you've got that, it's really going really well, things are happening for you. Mm. I'm like, no, I've not even got started. Same. I'm like, Same. No, 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 I'm, I'm not happy. That one person was not... 150% happy with every little <laughs> yeah. bit of that thing that I did for them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but they were 100% happy. Yeah, but it's not good enough. Yeah. You always you always see there being room for improvement. Yeah, I think there's always room for improvement. I think it's about I think the biggest thing that any of us can do for our own mental health is start with our own self-care mm. and actually prioritizing our own self-care because like I think of my life in lanes. So lane one is me and my relationship with myself. Lane two is my relationship with my wife. Lane three is my relationship with each of my children. So I've got 3.1, 3.2 and 3.3 yeah. in no particular order. They're just in case any of them are listening. They probably <laughs> won't be, but just in case they are, they're all yeah. equally, equally loved. <coughs> but you can't be the person in lane two or lane three if you're not actually comfortable with where you're at in lane one. Mm. Now, what does that look like? Well, one of the things that I've got on my watch is actually the wheel of life. Mm. So that I'm constantly thinking, like literally on the way here, after I've voice noted you, I, che I checked in with Gem and was like, you okay? I've not spoken to you this morning because I left really early. What's, what's today look like? Because we've had quite an emotional few days. Yeah. Would I have done that three years ago before I was doing that? Probably not. Mm. Maybe I wouldn't. You know, would I have voice noted my son this morning and say, hi, how's things going? Are you back from Sheffield? Okay. Because mm -hmm. he's at uni in London, so he lives in London. What's made you be more like that? Um, the work I've done on my mindset, the work I've done on my own neuroscience, the work I've done with coaches and mentors that I've had mm -hmm. to, to drive and improve my own self-awareness mm -hmm. and the massive investment I've made in my own self-development. Yeah. You know, I, and you're talking to the guy that flew to Scotland to have his brain map to work yeah, yeah, out yeah. his wives, you know. So I think that's like the, one of the first posts I ever saw before I even met you. Oh, really? Yeah. And what I'd was when I yeah was that post? And I'd added you on social media and obviously knew what you did. And I was sort of like, you know, getting deeper into the property space and went for a mad friend friend adding thing on Facebook. Yeah. And you were one of them. Yeah. 
And then I, you know, I, just to make me not feel special. No, no, no. But what? I'm, no, yeah. But hang on, hang on. I'm, I'm joking. Yeah, hang on. So you know, out of the thousands of people that I've probably added over the past couple of years, you're the first one on my podcast. Well, there you go. So that should say something yeah, to it you. Does, thank um, you. Because you know, I watched that video. I think you filmed yourself with yeah, this did, mad did. hat on your head. Yeah, it it's looked, like a scrum cap. Looked like a skull cap. Yeah, it didn't does. It? Exactly. And you had all these probes and that yeah. in you. And I was like, what the fuck is this geezer doing? Um, and that was my first fucking impression. I was yeah, like, what the fuck loon? is this? Guy yeah. doing right so but obviously I, I looked into it a bit more and actually read into why you yeah. were doing it uh, and since then obviously I've met you and we've spoken about what you do why you do what you do and I've got a much better understanding of what that fucking yeah. thing was on your head <laughs> right um, but you know if you could give anyone some you know, like you know pointers so if anyone might be going through hard times I mean because I know that you know previously you've had problems with Drugs, yeah, alcohol, certainly have, yeah, um, and you probably like me, uh, used them as a crutch. Yeah, oh, it was a massive crutch. Yeah, definitely. Why, why, why? So, I mean, was it was that the industry that you were in? Um, yeah, the I, circle, th- I think, the circles I think you were it was. In? I don't think it was the circles. I think it was it was the industry I was in, the kind of boom bust culture that exists within construction, the love hate relationship that the banking industry has with construction, mm-hmm. the kind of shit attitude that clients tend to have towards contractors and to to the construction industry in general mm. um it was a, it was a combination of all of those things and if i'm really really honest my ego was also involved in it yeah you know i was 30 years old i was md of a business i was a director of three other businesses that i was head hunted into each single every single one of them mm. it wasn't i didn't set my own company up and call myself the ceo oh, yeah, look at me yeah you know yeah, yeah, what yeah. with one bit be- like one me. member of staff <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you know what i mean it was days of roles that i was very much head hunted into and um through no fault of, of the business's own um the banking industry fell out of love with construction we bought a site through one of the businesses that was contaminated mm. but basically it was cut along so short there was some issues with the geotechnical survey that were um manipulated to make us make it look like it was it was a, a good site and it wasn't nice um, yeah it, it dominated a whole group of businesses so, so yeah it was um that's what i say so it's high pressure yeah, massively. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the story about what happened in Egypt, it yeah, certainly yeah. wasn't fun. Yeah. Um, would I change it? It's just made me go cold. That's what, you know, I'm going to lead on to the, you know, one of my next questions is, and you're, you're probably like me where you don't regret much in your life. Because Very you, few things I regret. Because you learn from it. So if yeah, you're exactly. the sort of person like me, you don't look at mistakes that you've made or, or bad situations as being regretful. You look at them as learning points. And you try and develop from that personally. I get that. But what is, if anything, your biggest regret or something that you didn't do that you wish you had have done sooner or something that you didn't do and you know deep down that you should have done that one thing? Um, I think there's a few things. I think I... So my first job as a site manager um, was when I was very, very early in my 20s. And when they offered me the job, I felt like they had massively taken a gamble on me and invested in, in offering me an opportunity. And I literally threw myself into that job. It's mm. one of the reasons I've been, you know, I've had such a successful career because I joined a site manager through just relentless hard work and sheer determination and application, rose to be an ops, the ops manager within 10 years and then ended up being offered to buy the company. Yeah. So, you know, it was beneficial, but, mm. you know, I ended up getting divorced. I didn't. I wasn't present really very yeah. much for Oliver's. Um, certainly, his very very early years. Yeah, you know, we were we were getting divorced. I would have him at weekends. You know, and I was far from perfect. Like I would go and pick him up on a Friday, and I'd be absolutely battered because in mm. five in five days, I might have done like literally seventy hours. Mm. 70, 80 hours easily. And probably all the other external stuff you were getting Pl- up to at Yeah, the exactly, time. yeah. Plus right. all the stuff that was going on outside of work. Mm. So, yeah, it was it was a really tough time. And, you know, was that the right course of action? You know, who knows? But I wouldn't be sitting here where I am today if I hadn't gone on that journey and mm. I wouldn't be able to add so much value and to And draw people's. from that experience. Yeah, and one of the things that... that I get as feedback from people that I work with is like the depth of knowledge bank that I've got based mm. on real practical examples that I can evidence yeah. is of massive value to other people. So yeah, yeah, yeah. whilst yes, it wasn't probably 
the best way I could have set myself up. It's certainly hugely valuable to other people now, and it's why I'm so passionate mm. about sharing sharing some of that stuff with people so that they don't make those same mistakes. Is there anything that you'd go back and do differently? You know, would you, you know, it's a hard question, isn't it? Because like you just said, you know, if you hadn't done all those things <coughs> that you've done and have experienced what you've experienced, you wouldn't be who you are now. But if you had that opportunity, would you go back and do it differently? Would I go back? I don't think I would do anything differently. I think I think there are things that I would have done, I might have done with some more humility. Mm. Because, you know, being an operations director of a, a bit, you know, thirty million pound business, managing a lot of people, your ego can get in the way and I'm not yeah. proud to admit it, but you know, I had an ego. Foresight's a brilliant quality if you can if you can harness yeah. it, if you can see things for what they are and, yeah. and look into the future a little bit. It's yeah, a absolutely. Great tool, isn't it? Yeah, so um, I think probably that would be the thing, maybe show, you know, you know, I've always had emotional intelligence, but sometimes, you know, when you're talking big numbers and, and egos and stuff and, you know, construction, there's a lot of, uh, too, way too much testosterone in construction. <laughs> Fucking hell is Way that? too much testosterone. You know, my, the best boss I've ever, ever had was MD of Kenyans, and she was the ex-MD of Gala Bingo, mm. like literally na national gambling business. Mm. She knew nothing about construction, mm. but she's the best boss I've ever had. I was going to say, I learned more about people do you feel than like anyone else. That's because that construction generally is a male-dominated yeah, industry. Yeah, unfortunately it is, yeah. Yeah. And it's something that I'm really passionate about. Like some of the people that I've, I've had through my training course, some of the people that I coach and mentor are, are female leaders. Yeah. And I'm massively passionate about supporting their learning and their education because we need to get at, get to a more balanced situation where actually it's more 50 mm. 50. It's nice to see women on site. I mean, for coming from a background yeah. of where I'm on site all the time and you are surrounded by Neanderthals at the best of times. Yeah, quite you know. often. Yeah, it's nice to see that divide on site and actually see women on site. And uh, you know, I, I, it's funny because obviously when I'm in the, on the ground from from that perspective and I'm working with the guys, they see a woman come on site. It's like they're like dogs. Do you know what I mean? But that's purely because they're not used to. I don't know why yeah, well, they go they, home to their yeah. wife at the end of the day yeah. and they've got a mother and all. It's not I like they've yeah. never seen a female before. Yeah. Um, it's just like uh, the environment that they're in. I think and it's unfortunately. Like, and yeah. it's not going to get any better until we address the issues around site welfare, mm. because you've got, you know, it's got you know, who re who really, let's have it right, wants to go and have a shit in the thunderbox. <laughs> You know, if you've got a choice between Mate, an, an office, a Thunderbox, or the Ritz Carlton, yeah. you ain't going to be going dropping money in a Thunderbox. Depends what I had for dinner the night before, if I'm totally fucking honest with you. But um, yeah, I've, I've gone in all of them places to the toilet, and I, I, I don't favour the Thunderbox, I must say. It's disgusting. Yeah, and that's the thing. Until we actually realise that this is a place of work. <laughs> and we're humans, and not we're animals. Hu yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that'd be. Then, I beg to differ with that sometimes. <laughs> fucking hell. The toilet habits of some people on site is oh, questionable, mate. Um <laughs> That's absolutely disgusting. But if you could go back to an 18-year-old version of Richard Stone, what would you say to him now? What would I say to what him? What would you say to him? I would say, don't be in such a hurry. Yeah. I think, don't be in such a hurry. That's massive. In just them few words, this has made me think, if I said that to my 18-year-old self, I've, you know, I, 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 I'm even still now, I'm, I, I like to steam through things. And I like to look at things with the end in sight, as in, you know, completing a task and yeah. smashing that, getting on to the next one and constantly rolling on yep. as you do, because that's the sort of environment that we're in. Yeah. And, it, you know, everything's like program, productivity, mm. cash, you know, all of these things. All result, drive, result, like, result. Yeah, bang, 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 bang. Right. Are we on program? Are we on, uh, is stuff and then before there? you know it, you've gone through the, like the whole year or however long that period is and realised that you've missed out on some critical stuff yeah putting it simply um you know like having kids like you, I, I picked up on a minute ago that you mentioned uh you didn't actually say it in those words but i got the vibe that maybe one of one of your regrets if you could say it was a regret that, is that you were missing and absent in in the early years of your son's life yeah yeah it would be yeah yeah. I'd love to have spent spent more time with him again obviously there's external influence yeah, of because is, yeah. of that i'm not yeah, saying absolutely. that you know oh if I could go back and change that, I'd spend the rest of my life with my ex. And f yeah. I'm not saying that. Yeah. What I'm saying is that yeah. if there was a regret there, that's mm. that's obviously one of yours. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And that's massive to me because, you know, when I had my kids, as you know, they're only little three and one. Um, 
you know, and you know my history with, with growing up with my dad not being around, my real dad not being around and things like that. And I have quite a disjointed family. I've always grown up and thought, I want to be a good dad. I want to give my kids better. I'm not saying I had a really bad upbringing because my stepdad was fucking brilliant and I had a really great family mm. network. Yeah. Like, you know, my nan and granddad and all that sort mm. of stuff. But the fact still remains that when you're a young boy... You know, you want your dad about, don't you? Yeah. You know, or or a daughter, yeah. whatever. You want your dad, and I never had that. You know, not my biological anyway. And and in a way, that that did that did damage me a little bit. I think there's a really interesting book actually about this whole subject, which I would urge you to read. Go called on. Raising Boys. Raising Boys. Yeah, I'll send you a link to it. Yeah, afterwards. do. I'll check it out. Yeah, it's I'll really check interesting. It out. And it's about the difference between boys and girls. Is it? Yeah, there is a massive really, difference. Really interesting book. But I've had my little girl first, and like you know, she's three, and I was absolutely shitting myself when we got that, you know, the sex reveal. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I'm not ashamed to say, I actually got really upset with Ali about it at the time like we actually like when 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 it was revealed in the room and like, i was having a little girl i actually got really angry about it um <coughs> not angry to the point where i was violent but you know i was really upset and the more and more i analyzed it over time i think i was more apprehensive mm. i was more upset at the fact that i didn't really understand women or little girls, yeah. more to the point. Yeah. I was shitting myself, mate. And I was thought, how the fuck am I going to raise a little girl? Like, I come from like a family of boys. Yeah. Like all my cousins, my immediate cousins that I was friends with are boys. My brother's a boy. Um, you know what I mean? I come yeah. from quite a manly background. Yeah. And it's like, fucking hell, I've never been around a little girl before. And I shit myself, mate. But I'll be honest, it's actually like been the best thing that's like ever happened to me. Because it's made me... You know, you get you get certain things that happen to you in life where changes your outlook on things. And being becoming a parent is yeah. definitely one oh, of them. Is, is the single most huge moments thing that, yeah. in life where you yeah. actually pivot and actually say, "Okay, it's not about me anymore." Mm. Um, because I've I'll probably I'll probably still selfish sometimes. Now I think you've got to be to a certain extent to be successful. I think. Do you not yeah. think that? Do you think? That? Do you know what? It's really interesting you say that because I was interviewed recently um, in I think it was on Clubhouse. And we were talking about this, and I had a really interesting phrase about that, and it's really simple, and it was from a guy. So it's not this is not my philosophy. This is something I've heard, just to be clear. But I would love to credit the guy, but I can't remember his name. And he is really like, I mean, he's a billionaire, he's a really successful entrepreneur. Mm. His attitude is, you can't go on a journey in two cars. Yeah. So you can either be the super successful, 100% driven, 100 mile an hour person, or you can be the family man. Yeah. You can't be both. Mm. Now, whilst I understand the sentiment of that, and I think there is some There truth is an element it, of truth think, there. Yeah, I think it's like a lot of things. I think the real artistry and the point when you get to be actually feel really fulfilled is when you have a balance of both. Mm. Yeah, I do agree. Because you need the success to be, if you're, you know... And I can only talk from my own mindset and my own paradigm, but yeah. I need to feel successful to feel like I'm giving my best and I'm getting the best use out of this yeah. this body that I've got that yeah, carries same. my head around everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't feel like I was doing doing that justice and doing that service if I didn't have some success. Mm. So in order for me to be the best version of yourself and parent I can be, I need to be the best version of me. And that includes mm. an, an element of success. Now, yeah. does it mean that I need to have the nation's biggest training company? No. No. Does it mean I need 50 or 100 people on my course every week? No. Mm. I just need to feel comfortable with what I'm doing, mm. that I'm servicing and giving my clients a good service, and that everybody that has an interaction with me has a positive experience. Mm. That's it. Mm. That's that's my definition of success. Mm. I suppose everyone measures it in different ways. Of course they do. So and there's, I was personal. listening to Rob Moore the yep. other day, and you know he talks a lot about money. Um which I think is great. And, you know, I, when I didn't have a lot of understanding about money when I was, you know, younger, I, you know, money's the root of all evil. People say that all yep. the time. And what a load of bollocks that is. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and, and the old thing, money can't buy you happiness. Yep. What a load of bollocks. There's like, loads of mistruths around that's money. A, that is shit because that, yeah. I generally have found that the people that say that are skin. Yeah, of course Do you know are, what yeah. I mean? And it's like, well, yeah. hang on a minute. 
Money might you might not be able to go and buy a bag of happiness from the shop, or it depends. You probably can if you know a man. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I think we've both known a few we, of them yeah, yeah. in the past. But you know what I'm saying. It's yeah, like I, do, yeah. it's, um, I think money is important to understand, and it can buy things that bring happiness. You yeah, know? it can't buy you more time. No. But what it can do is allow you to use your time in a different way. Yeah, exactly. Do you know and what that, I mean? that's the key: is it buys yeah. you the freedom. And exchanging your time for money is yeah, massive, and people it is. don't. You know, we need worker bees. People, we need people that are just happy to go to work and work for a wage, and then go home and put their feet up and moan about earning. We need everybody. You know, we need a society where everybody's doing something that they feel fulfilled doing. Mm. So we need people that are quite happy to go and empty the bin. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course, there's not. There's massive value in that. I'm trying to say there is nothing wrong. There's nothing with doing a normal job. I'm not trying to slag people. There's nothing wrong with doing. uh, There's nothing wrong with doing any job. No, whether you sweep the street. Pick or, shit up or for whether you're Richard Branson, whatever you do yeah. is fine as long as you're doing something that you feel happy doing, doing mm. something that you feel fulfilled doing, and doing something that that you actually want to be the best at that you mm. can be. Yeah, no, I agree with that. You know, whether that's a fencer or a footballer or whatever on the footsie, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, mm. just be the best at what it is and do something that you're passionate about. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, so, if there's if there's one thing that you could change about yourself that you don't like. Or one particular quality of yourself that you think, oh, I shouldn't really do too much of that. Is there anything you change about yourself? Wow, there's two parts to that, I think. So, the, f- you know, I, and I'm a massive believer that I think sometimes your biggest strength can also be your biggest weakness. Mm. I've got a massively addictive personality. Mm. It's why I love what I Same. do because it's it's an addiction. Mm. You know. I do do so much pro bono stuff with, with people, you know, calls with people, helping people, sharing information for free mm. because I get a real buzz out of doing it and I love working. Yeah. So if there was one thing that I would change about myself, I've got a really shit relationship with food. Oh, oh mate, I'm, my mind's terrible. And it's why I'm like the size I am. <laughs> I and, fucking struggle so much. But I recognise that with myself. So I've actually signed up to do two fucking humongous challenges for charity this year. Yeah, what are you doing? I'm doing London to Paris on a bike. Oh, really? 300 miles on a bike, yeah. Oh, go on, mate. Um, and I'm going to do a marathon. Yeah? So oh, this mate. is my accountability. This is you fucking said it on here now. I'm going to be playing this I've already. It's already out there because I've already done... Um, done deals with people that I'm doing it to support them. Okay. Um, and causes that mean a lot to them. Nice. Um, but I'm also doing it for charity for causes that mean a lot to me as well. So Oh well done, mate. Yeah, Good luck so with that. It's um yeah, that's that would be the way I would answer that question, I think. Oh, that's awesome. And I am I'm similar. I my, my my relationship with food is fucking awful. I'm a, you know, I'm not a small bloke. Um, and I've always struggled with it since a young age. I used to get bullied when I was a kid, um, when I was younger, and I was always a big lad, do you know what I mean? Always a big lad. And people used to take the fucking piss, and it used to hurt. It mm. used to hurt, do you know what I mean, until I learned to punch straight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, then they and then they probably hurt more than me afterwards. But, that, yeah. you know, it did hurt for a long time, but I, I, I'm I'm comfortable as fuck with my, in my own skin now. You know, I am what I am, um, and I've been like that for a long time. Um, so it's nice to hear that, you know, there, there are things that I would change, but I think it's more personality traits for me. It's, okay. it's often that I I am too nice to people in certain situations. I give people the benefit of the doubt too much. Yeah, I can see both sides of that. And me and Gemma have this conversation, so just for context for anybody who's listening who doesn't know who Gemma is, Gem- Gemma's yeah. more... The better half. <laughs> yeah, the better half <laughs> of Stone. Um it's something we talk about a lot because in her career she was kind of like bought up, bought like trust no one. I yeah. will, I'll, I trust anybody until they give me a reason not to. I do as well, but fucking hell, how many times have you been fucked over by that? Oh, loads. But do you know what? And I've, I've, I've had this conversation a number of times, and I've been I've done a lot of podcasts, a lot of media work, so it's, there's a lot of stuff out there about it. But my att- my attitude is this: if I change who I am as a result of that experience, which is that person's behaviour, why let that person's behaviour change how I am? Because yeah. I'm naturally a trusting person. Yeah. So I don't want to let one person's shitty attitude affect my paradigm and how I would approach someone else because I'd be doing the other person that I might meet this afternoon or tomorrow, I'd be doing them a disservice. Mm. Why would I do that? Well, other people's opinions of you is none of your business, right? Do you know, there's so many people listen to unqualified opinion 
anyone else's opinion of you is is utterly irrelevant, it is. and it's it's not even any of your business because it's their opinion. It's theirs, and it says and more it about is them. only an opinion. Of course, it is. Like arseholes, everybody's got one. They don't need <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Um, so I'll, there's a question I do want to ask um, that I talk about a lot with a lot of people. Um, I think we've probably spoken about it before privately as well, but the property education space. Yep, it's a minefield. It certainly is. So unregulated minefield at present. What well. are your thoughts on the current market? I'm not asking you to name people who you think are killing it or necessarily who you think are not killing it, but what have you seen going on out there um, that you want to share? And you know, what are your opinions? Your opinions on what you're seeing going on at the moment? So I've seen some really amazing businesses, mentors, coaches, trainers. Delivering really good content mm. is the first thing that I would say. I've also seen the absolute opposite of mm. that. People just delivering stuff that they've just been given a slide deck to go and stand on a stage and deliver. Mm. Uh, that they don't necessarily believe in. They don't even be, don't even understand necessarily. Mm. Um, and I've also seen stuff that's actually not re- not relevant because, mm. you know, the world's moved on. Property the property industry evolves. Um, mm. But I've also seen stuff that's also factually incorrect mm. with legislation around safety and stuff that goes back to some of it goes back to nineteen ninety six. Mm. You know. That's been around a long time and it's still getting out very outdated. So so I think there's a massive bandwidth of of t- from from some of the very best stuff to some of the very, very worst stuff. Mm. I think some of it comes down to why are people in it in the first place? Mm. There's a lot of people that are actually delivering stuff that they're not even actually doing themselves. Mm. Um I mean we met for a guy called Andy Hubbard, Andrew Hubbard. Yeah. Um you know, he's one of the people he's actually doing. He does what, what he says he, he's doing. He's a, he's a trade background. Yeah, you know, exactly. I, that's why I, I, I resonated a lot with Andy and that's why I chose to yeah. go and to go through Andy's mentor program and, and be alongside Andy for that year because I related to him mm. and because he does what he says yeah, he's absolutely. doing. Yeah. Um, and there isn't, there isn't the smoke and mirrors with Andy. Or at least... What he says what you get. Yeah, with it's, Andy as, as an individual... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, as a person. As yeah. a person, yeah. Andy and Sam, lovely, love love Sam. They're lovely people. Really nice, genuine people. Um, but, you know, would you not agree that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that goes on? I think, moving away from talking about individuals... Yeah, I I'm think, not talking I about individuals in, here. Yeah, I think in, in the industry, there is undoubtedly a lot of smoke and mirrors. Well, do um, you, like, I'm saying that, you know, people, in a sense, dress things up in a way to make it sound a lot more appealing to people as if they were actually telling people the fucking truth of how hard it is. Yeah, Would... I think there's two parts to that. Sorry. Go on, no, go on. I, I think, think I think there's two bits to it. So I think, and Mike Winnett did an amazing documentary on this that's on YouTube for people to see. I think there's, there is a, there is a mindset of if you do something and that is your job, then it's easy. If you go and ask mm. a dentist how easy it is to pull a tooth out, you know, it's an easy thing for them to do. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to do it. So for me, it would be really <laughs> no. hard to do. Yeah. So when people say, oh, well, they make it look easy, well, because to them it is easy. So I do think there is there is a part of it is it about actually when you're doing something, rinse and repeat all day long. So like deal packaging, for, for example, because it's, you know, people put a lot of stuff, you know, if you talk about developing, you might build one house in a year and you'll, you'll be successful. Mm. A deal package has got to do a lot of deals to meet that same level of success. Yeah. But people can successfully be a deal package and teach people to do it. Mm. Absolutely. Does it mean that everybody that does that course is going to be a successful deal package? No. 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 Because they're not going to have the same determination. They're not going to have the same grit. They're not going to put the same amount of time into it. Mm. As someone as maybe as somebody, else as somebody that's already doing it. I so think what I'm taking from what you're it's saying It's going to be hard for them people. It's basically down, you know, success is down to the individual. Right, and I, I agree with that. No one's coming to save any of us. We all, exactly. Our own success is our own choice. And how you take what you're being told is also down to your individual perception. Yeah, of and if you're someone that's easily led yep. or you're you're easy to put an impression upon, yeah. then the likelihood is that you're going to get sucked in to a lot of this pitter pat of the sales talk yeah, and all that stuff if you're yeah. easily impressionable. Yeah. Whereas if you're someone like me or yourself... Or you're quite analytical. You read between the lines often. Um, 
I think it's quite easy to see through who's real and who's not. Yeah, it's not hard to work is out. Is it? It's to not, me, yeah, or think, to you, yeah. but I've sat next to people who I've, who I've had good conversations with who don't see things like that. And it's like, why can't you see that? Yeah, I think you know, I think you know. I mean, this is a limited time podcast. So it's oh, yeah, like, I'm looking at the <laughs> clock thing. Fuck, like, I could sit here and talk for an like, hour. Yeah, I was shit. just going to say this. So it's almost like to answer this effectively and do justice to your listeners is probably or watchers is difficult to do. Yeah, but I think you know, common sense. Yeah, you know, common sense is like deodorant. The yeah. people that need it the most use it the least, and <laughs> yeah. and actually, just take a step back and go. Is this realistic? Is what I'm being told realistic? Yeah. Firstly, is the person that's telling me it, what's their motivation what's for telling me it? Yeah. What's their Are motivation? Are they doing it to sell me a further yeah. mentor in exactly. program? What's their credibility? I mean, one of the the, the be- most amazing bits of feedback we've had from the course we run is people are like, there's no upsell. Mm. You're not trying to sell me. There is no card machine at the back of the room. We're not, we're not selling anything beyond yeah. come and spend three days with us and learn project management. Yeah. That's it. And that's and a massive thing as well, and it, the, it is. The, the inverted commas card machine yeah. joke yeah. is like you know every yeah. single property networking or event that you yeah. go to has a card machine at the back, or there is an upsell. You know, yeah. don't you ever ever go to a free course and think that it's going to be a free day full of absolute yeah. gems because it won't be. You know it won't be, and I know it won't be. Yep. But for the people that are coming through the door that don't know that, they think they need that next step. When yeah. really, to me, it's just about asking the right questions in the right places to the right people. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, we've got people that we coach and mentor, and people that we've got on ma- on two. Yeah, but they've chosen to do that. But they've cho- they've they've reached out to us and said, "Yeah, Look, we've done your different. course. Can you mentor us for a year, please?" That's different. That's them, and I will work with people. That's like organic that. sales, absolutely. Mate. Not, we don't go, do you know what? Yeah, you, this is what you need to do. That's the complete system. That's everything you need to yeah. go and do that. Well, that's people Done. That's people buying into you, your, you, yeah. you as a person and your product because yeah. of you, not because they're not being given all of the right information. Yeah, exactly. Do you and get me? Yeah, that's totally. where the fucking difference yeah. is for me. And that's why I wrote my course because... That, you know, I've, I've been approached by a lot of other training businesses to deliver their content around project management that's out there and I've declined. I can only deliver my version mm. of my truth. Yeah, your experience. That's it. And I'm not interested in someone else buying a franchise. I've, I've, asked, I've been asked by people, can we buy the right to sell your course in different geographical locations in the country? No, you fucking can't. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't. It's you. They can't buy you. How, can how they? do you think that's going to work? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's you, not. You, 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 you care about your product, mate, a, a lot. And uh, I care about the people that we t- that we work with. Yeah. that's what I care about. Yeah, is that you is do the care people. about the, your product? As yeah, in the, of course, the content that you're giving oh, God, people. It took me a year to run my course. Yeah, exactly. And it was you know it was a really hard year. You know we didn't do a lot. I did some consultancy stuff and some non exec stuff. Mm. You know we massively. Uh, adjusted our standard of living for a year mm. in order to do that but the benefit that people have got out of it already yeah. i had a call with someone this morning literally within six weeks of being on course number one they've saved 200 plus hours 200 grand 200 hours 200 hours oh, yeah, 200 sorry hours. oh yeah That's yeah I've, I've saved people uh, i mean literally someone what we today wednesday monday i had a call with somebody literally over a contract hundred thousand pound in 10 minutes on a phone call mm. because People get stuff like that wrong yeah. really easily, and they don't realise what they're what they're signing. And they, they like I was called with somebody last week signed signed a contract that's not even a contract. Really, it says contract on the front. It's not a contract because of the way it's been written, it's utterly unenforceable, and you can't make anybody do anything that's written in it. That's a scary, scary world, isn't it? And I think for anyone that's not in that space, it's just a massive, massive web. Of yeah. shit that they just won't understand. Just getting getting stuff right is you know is crucial. But people want to rush into getting their, their either their refurb on site if they're doing a conversion or get the build up. Build. Yeah, exactly. Hey, we've all been yeah. guilty. I've been guilty of it. Yeah. I'm going to say I haven't we've all been. been guilty of it. Yeah, but it's about doing it the right way. And you know, if you sa- if you spend a week at the beginning, you'll get a month back on the oh build yeah, hundred percent. But if you shave a week off. Mm. you can add an extra month on because yeah. all day long you will have missed bits it won't be set up properly it won't be systemized properly it won't have all the right interfaces in it mm. I mean, how many times do you look at a job and the program's wrong 
most of the time. And it changes yeah, weekly, it daily, do you know what yeah. I mean? So, um, okay, so moving on, because we're going to wrap this up soon, but social media. Yep. Do you feel it's more damaging than rewarding? Wow, that's a big question. Do I think it's more damaging than rewarding? I think it depends on whether you're a creator or a, or a user. Or a consumer. Yeah, if you're a consumer, potentially, mm. yeah. You, you know, get lost scrolling all day. Yeah, you lost nine um, hours scrolling yeah. through bullshit. And the first thing, the worst thing is TikTok. Yeah. You know, people are literally oh, it's awful. just disappearing down a rabbit hole for hours on that. Um, I think it depends. I think that, you know, if there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in construction, there's even more smoke and mirrors on social media. because but that's, that, that feeds into that, doesn't it? Yeah. Because, like, the people in the property space, they, you know, wherever you go, it's like, utilise your social media, make yeah. sure you're doing this and that on your social media. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But, you know, if you're there constantly comparing yourself to someone else who is nothing like you yep. or doing something that's totally different to what you're doing and yet you're still sat there comparing your level of success, of success to theirs yep i mean comparison is the thief of joy it is massively. Yeah, i don't know who said it it's quite a famous phrase it's yeah. not mine but no, it is it's it's so so true but i think there's also a different side to social media in that lots of people will use it in this the term social proof yeah so They'll go and do some due diligence on somebody they want to work with, and I go, "Oh, they got yeah, that looks really good on social media. I've seen yeah, that. Right they, I've seen that they've built that wall, or put that fence up, or tarmac that drive, or mm. or put that roof on, or whatever." Yeah, but they're not qualified to even be making that judgment call in the first place. And actually, mm. them images, the stock images that somebody's rinsed off of someone else's website, they're not even their own work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think it can be really great. But it can be but fucking it catastrophic. Can be, it can be really dangerous. Mm. And you can also be guilty by association. Yeah. Just by being involved. Just by sharing someone yeah, else's absolutely. post who who might last week have done something really offensive yeah. to a thousand people and you didn't realise and yeah. so it's a minefield, isn't it? Yeah, it is a minefield. Yeah, you've got I think tread it's, very carefully. It's great for building brands and it's like now it's like, you know, if you've got a company or you're, you're trying to build your network. I think it's fantastic, you know, and I think there's it's, no better way of doing it than no. you know anybody that tells me they can't set up a business these days is it's, like, never well, mate, so well, easy. it's literally free advertising. Do you yeah. know what I mean? For people pay millions. Yeah. If millions. what you've got is worth something to someone, on so, there's no so, reason why yeah. you can't make money. Out exactly. Of it. There's so many different platforms that people can utilize, and I think it's, it's you're stupid if you're not. All the time, Hence it? why I'm sat here doing this. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because really, it's like. I feel like I've got a message to share through my experiences, my life experience, not just what I do as a job and what I do for money. Um, but I think there's a there's value in that. People yeah. like to, you know, hear about other people's experiences and find out new coping methods and yeah, find absolutely. out how someone else done something. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, and I always think for me, like with depression and things like that, especially as I've been growing up and shared my story with a lot more people, it humbles me. Mm. Because, you know, my, my, my situations have always been the worst to me because they're relative to you yeah, individually. Yeah. But then when you hear about other people's stuff uh, that, are, that are fucking, you know, miles and miles away from where your problems were, it's like, oh, fucking hell, like, mine weren't that bad. Yeah. You know, they were to me at the time. Yeah. I could sit there and still get teary about some of the stuff that I used to go through, but then... That's nothing compared to what a lot of other people have Yeah, from. but also you've matured as well in that time. Some people so don't, do they? Some people don't. No, it's very true. I mean, depression's horrific. My wife suffers from it. Yeah, it's, yeah, and it's, it's horrible, yeah, mate. Yeah, the curse of the strong, they call it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, I can believe yeah. that because it's like you build this, uh, you build your walls up and, you know, like what I take from what you just said, like the from the strong, yeah. it's like you, you're almost... Um, putting this guard around yourself and when that goes the vulnerability that brings along with it is fucking insane yeah vulnerability is huge vulnerability is really really massive subject and having the courage to be vulnerable and to lead from a point of view of being vulnerable mm. is really difficult for a lot of people yeah. I think I think this sort of stuff is starting to become easier mm. as we move into like a new generation yeah but it is still difficult. Like, I mean, I wouldn't. I can't have a conversation with my parents about mental health. No. I mean, I did my first ever, ever, ever video I ever did on social media was on LinkedIn, mm. telling the world I was going to see a counselor. Really? Because my head was a shed. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's oh, on my LinkedIn. Play. It's still there. It's no, no, yeah, no, fair years. play, no, fair play to you, yeah. mate. Um, I, I, 
I've never been scared to well share my stuff on social media because I just think you know what if 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 my outlook and what I've been through and the fact that I've come through it you know positively yep. can can help one person then that's that's fucking amazing to me yeah. you know that's the thing isn't it I mean that's why I'll never ever take that video down but for context I recorded that video I recorded it and I thought do you know what if I'm going to put this out there Oliver was 15, I think, 14, 15 at the time. Yeah. Lived with his mum, didn't live with me. I thought, I don't want him to see it. I don't want yeah. someone to send him that and go, what's the matter with what's your dad? What's your dad, yeah. And yeah. my dad was semi-retired, but still quite active on some of the professional social media. So I wanted to let them know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I phoned my son and said, look, this is what I'm going to do. And he said to me, dad, you will never make me prouder than if you do that oh really yeah my mum said to me your dad's on a conference call I'll get him to phone you back but don't ever put that video out because you'll never have another client no one will ever work with you everyone will think you're going mad blah blah, blah. So, okay so I phoned one of my coaches who's got the biggest minerals I've ever seen in a man mm. and he said he said to me don't post that video change your password mm. to password one and let me know when you've done it but don't post that video and I spoke to a lady that at the time was doing my social media. <coughs> a lady I don't work with anymore, but I've still got an awful lot of time for. We still speak regularly. Mm. And she said to me, the same as what my son had said, mm. what, it would be an amazing, courageous thing you could do. Mm. So the next day I posted it, and I got really mixed feedback. I got loads of clients reach out to me and go, are you okay? Can I do anything? Is there anything we can help with? What's yeah, happened? Yeah. Um, I got some private messages that were absolutely horrific. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I got some people reach out to me that were experiencing the same mm. and asked me who I was going to see. Mm. So I posted it at like half five in the morning and by half seven I'd had like 26 people message me saying thank you. Mm. Like, I've now had the courage to go and do something as a, mm. as a consequence of what you've done. And some of those people I still speak to today. That's massive. Like you, you, The influence just by one action... To have that influence on exactly. multiple and, and and the people that probably didn't yeah. message you, but that's you the thing did help, yeah, that's, and you'll never yeah, know. You, do you exactly. know what I mean? And that's yeah. the ripple effect. I'm not bothered about the metrics. It's a, it's more to, it's no, to you're not doing it for likes. No, exactly. It's to you know. I don't know how many people saw that and, and never commented. I don't care how many yeah, people yeah, saw yeah. it and didn't comment. If it's done something, it's helped yeah. them, well, or it, even better. It's helped them have a greater sense of awareness that they might just check in on someone. Well, they're the sorts of people that are the reasons behind you do what you do, isn't it? You know, if to, to, if it's the people, just, the unsung, yeah. the, you know, the people yeah, exactly. that you never hear from yeah, exactly. that will go, hang on a minute, I was listening to this guy last And week. I don't need to hear from him. I don't, yeah. I don't, I'm not saying I don't want to because I love engaging yeah, with people. Yeah, yeah. I love talking to people all the time. I'm chatterbox. But... It's the silent fans, mate, you know, that, what that only ever exactly, pop up every now and then and exactly. go, oh, mate, I love that podcast yeah. you do. And you're like, fucking hell, I've been podcasting or doing whatever yeah. I'm doing for X amount of time. That person's yep. probably been listening to me for the whole yeah. time and you didn't even know it. Yep. I get people messaging me on Facebook all the time that like I used to go to school with that we weren't particularly friends at school. We knew each other, but yeah. we weren't friends in so social yeah. circles. Uh, and they message me all the time going, mate, I love what you're doing. I love watching you. And I'm like, really? I'm like... 20 years ago, we wouldn't have even really nodded at each yeah. other in the street, but you're on my Facebook because we know each other. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Acquaintance and you're watching me. Close to friends, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's crazy, isn't it? That, yeah. You know, just have, by having the balls and the courage to stand convicted and talk about what you believe in and, and the pros and cons of that. Yeah, I, someone asked me on a podcast last year to sum it up, and I said the best way I can sum it up is the, the willingness to be courageously imperfect. Mm, definitely, mate. I love that. I love that. Love that. And I'm going to end on that note. The okay. willingness to be courageously perfect. Imperfect. Imperfect. I love that. I really like that. So I just wanted to say thank you That's right. for being... Uh, I think we had a really good conversation, Yeah, mate. same. It could have gone on fucking I could have actually <laughs> just thought, fuck it, let's just record another three episodes and I'll drop them at different times. But that was golden. I really appreciated it. Um Thanks for your time, mate. Did we get through all your questions that you wanted to Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. There was shitloads cool. more, but that was more... I, I wanted to let the conversation just roll. I think yeah, that's, that's how I want to do this podcast anyway. So Definitely the best way to do it. It's open, mate. You yeah. know, I just want to talk and see where it goes. Human conversation is much better than stilted, like, uh, yeah. fixed, fixed questions. Yeah, I don't want people to know the questions I'm going to ask mm. every time. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So, But, yeah, again, thanks for your time today, Rich. Right. Um, and, yeah. 
Look forward to having you on again in the future, Yeah, definitely. Mate. All right. Look forward to it. Best Sweet, of luck. Mate. Cheers. The Tea Hearts. Proudly brought to you by eGrowth Media.